you so much. Thank you. That's great. Well, what a joy to be here, ladies and gentlemen, and actually see you in person. I'm Tanya Breyer. I'm a CNBC anchor. And of course, you know Richard Sharp, chairman of the BBC. And Alex just said to you, what we're going to be discussing is the role of the BBC over the next 10 years, how we create, consume and relate to news. And of course, in this ever changing media landscape, how does the BBC compete in the current and upcoming landscape, both commercially and going toe to toe with tech companies and their technology? What can the BBC do for the UK at home and abroad? And of course, joining us to answer all those questions and more, the challenges the BBC faces, the opportunities they face, is their new chairman. Please welcome Richard Sharp. Well, Richard, it's great to see you here. And again, welcome to our international audience from around the world. And it's wonderful to see some of you here in person. Richard, you just joined as chairman in February 2021. What a time to join. Unprecedented historical times with the pandemic. And of course, everything that's been going on within the corporation itself. How have the first few months been for you? Uh, challenging, I think, is a sort of short word. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you said that the BBC has to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with global players who have massive footprints. So I'd prefer to think we have to go head-to-head -to -head with them, um, because certainly at the moment their footprint is much greater than ours in one sense, um, and they have capital resources in another sense. But actually, when you really look at the detail of what the BBC is, it's quite humbling. Uh, for example, we reach 500 million people around the world. We have 94 news of operation, uh, offices around the world. Uh, we have a, a brand which is almost 100 years established, which has a tremendous resonance in terms of trust, um, ethics, uh, and truth. And what has happened is the acceleration of events that have taken place as a result of COVID, in many ways have played to the BBC's advantage. Uh, digitalization is obviously underpinning COGX, but also other aspects of what you're addressing, which are the right messages um, in terms of ethics, in terms of climate change and innovation. And throughout its history, part of the, DNA's, part of the DNA of the BBC is to embrace new technologies, um, to deliver truth to the world, to support values that are critical to make people's lives better in terms of issues such as uh, democracy and freedom. Um, and then if you think about the changes that have taken place, not just as a result of COVID, but also Britain's place in the world, um, it's also uh, an opportunity for us to ask ourselves questions of how can we, in a, in a patriotic sense, um, drive what's best about Britain into the world overall. So in the first uh, 12 weeks I've been there, I've been, if you like, lift, in American parlance, lifting the hood to see, see what's there. And within the BBC, there's an extraordinary talent. Um, I think there is some anxiety about the nature of competition, um, but there's also a fantastic opportunity in terms of rising to the challenges, um, because uh, although on the face of it, many of our competitors of world scale in terms of their resources, and as I said, their footprints. Um, we have the intellectual horsepower, the creativity, and critically the English language, as well as the brand, in order to uh, compete successfully. Well, what's so interesting, Richard, is of course you've come from a financial mm -hmm. background, 23 years at Goldman Sachs, before that JP Morgan. What, why did you want to take on this role and what do you think that you're going to bring to it that's going to be effective? Well, I think if we'd had this conference as recently as, let's say, seven or eight years ago, um, the focus in technology would have principally been, how can I make money out of riding this wave? And I think what's changed has been people have understood as a result of environmental considerations and other aspects of uh, the life that they're living 
that ethical considerations have to be balanced as well. And so in that sense, the, that element of caring about uh, public service is also something that inspires me personally. So um, that, that isn't just doing this job, it was also working with the Bank of England for financial stability for the UK. And at the heart of it, and, and as you know, um, Goldman has been described uh, by Rolling Stone as the, as the vampire squid, so it's not as though I'm unfamiliar with capitalism. At the, heart, at the heart of it, capitalism has an enormous strength in terms of competition, innovation, efficiencies, but it also has an Achilles heel. And the Achilles heel is the prioritization of the financial return on capital, whereas the BBC is able to bring other measures to bear, which creates a distinctive advantage. And so I think if we think about going forward 10 years and we look and, and uh, of the role the BBC has to play, it chimes with many of the considerations that this new age of entrepreneurs that this COGX yeah. represents uh, really, really demonstrate. Richard, coming in to your role as chairman, you have four years mm -hmm. uh, in your tenure. What is your vision board, so to speak, your yeah. own personal one? What have you come in to do, shake up? Well, I don't know about shaking up. I think, I think bringing, hopefully, um, some of my own experiences to bear so that within the BBC, there can be a fresh evaluation of different tactics um, or different possibilities or ways of thinking that can uh, encourage the BBC to be more successful and capture the opportunity um, in a different way than it might might have without me. And I, you know, obviously, there's a lack of humility in that. And um, uh, uh, maybe some people who know me think that that's appropriate. I don't know. Um, but but <laughs> but I certainly don't think they've had somebody quite like me with the background that I've had in the organization in, in the past, in, in a governance role as a non-executive. They've also got a new governance structure. So the board itself was set up because of the failure of different governance structures. It's a unitary board with executives, non-executives, more like a corporate board in that sense. Um, and the board, in a corporate sense, has to own strategy. So the critical thing is the non-execs and the executive directors on the board own the strategy. And therefore, as part of that, the BBC wants to have non-executives who bring to bear different experiences because obviously the nature of our competition is very different now. It's global. Yeah. Um, we're, we're competing against, as I said, capitalist organizations. Mm -hmm. And um, we, the experience I've had to, bear, had to bring to bear as an advisor, as a private equity investor, um, I, I hope is helpful in arriving at not just the right strategy, but also some of the tactics. Well, as you say, you do face fierce financial and technological competition from across the industry. How can you challenge and compete with that, with the resources that you have? Well, look, I, um, I think everybody in this conference knows. They know organizations with maybe 20, 30, 40 people that have uh, global resonance. And that's right across, that's whether that's, that's, that's um, in education. Uh, 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 so I think that, I, th I don't think you can count, uh, I don't think you can count resources in terms of financial scale or in terms of people in the way you've done in the past. I think what it really is about is content. And the great thing about the digital, the digitally connected environment we live in is that the marketplace is there for everybody, no matter how large or small. So the question is, what is our content? How distinctive are we? How innovative are we? Are we? And what advantages do we have? So we have a competitive threat, uh, which is which is the competition, but we have a competitive opportunity, which is to deliver our skills and capabilities to larger audiences more efficiently. And that there, therein lies a challenge, I think, which I'll come back to. So I don't think it's a scale issue. It's a case of ensuring that we have the continue to have the creative creative people that we have, the innovative culture that the BBC needs to have, and I would say sounds is, for example, a good, good example of that. Yeah, I'd say as well. And the fact that the BBC was seeking to do streaming um, in 2003, 2004, and got limited. So we, we've been ahead of the curve. We were limited then by the regulator, where Netflix was, let's say, about a three, three and a half, four billion dollar company. So the, so the disintermediation of large organizations between consumer and content plays to our advantage. 
in, provided we are creative, provided we're self-critical, and provided we are a home to talented people. And I think being in the UK, with our ability to attract a thoroughly diverse group of people, means that we can deliver that. We deliver our news, for example, in 40 languages. You know, no other organization has that capability. The English language allows us to deliver a lot of our non-news content increasingly around the world to people who can appreciate it. Um, the quality of what we do in terms of uh, feeding on the tradition in the UK of storytelling, um, uh, innovation, um, uh, uh, enlightenment, and it's a very positive thing. We have terrific educational establishments here. We have centers of excellence um, in science, and you see that in our natural history programs. But critically, as a public service broadcaster, we can take risk. We can take risk that then leads to success, where sometimes capitalist organizations may, may, may face more difficulty, because we can see intrinsically, whether it's in education or in science uh, or in truthfulness, we can see that there's a value in the way we do it, irrespective of the financial return. Richard, you mentioned Netflix there, of course. How would you view the Netflixes, the Amazons, the other big tech companies? Do you feel that you have to compete with them, even beat them, or is there room for collaboration? Oh, look, we have, we have uh, I mean, Peaky Blinders is a good example. We have collaborated uh, with, and we continue to collaborate. Um, what, if we're thinking about 10 years' time and how they're positioning themselves, the question I ask myself is, what is, how are they trying to create walled gardens? I think you all know from your own experiences, from their data management, that what they're seeking to do is to keep you within their architecture. And then the challenge for us is the cross subsidization. So, um, and whether money, uh, huge amounts of money, can buy them an advantage that diminishes the value that we bring to our, cust our customers, if you like, our licensee pairs, or, or viewers and listeners around the world. And clearly, the amount of money that's being thrown around uh, represents a challenge to us. But it's, it's, it's not one that we, could, that we can't necessarily rise to. I think we can rise to it. Um, I think that they've, um, uh, th you know, they, their worldview starts from a different part of the world. I think there's a value in a British worldview. Uh, and I also think that we, as a brand, attract people who want to work in the BBC and I think that can be a cultural advantage, potentially, um, you know, providing uh, within the BBC, um, people continue to feel that we're a value-led organization. Well, Richard, ahead of becoming chairman, when you were speaking to the House of Commons Digital, Cultural, Media and Sport Committee back in January, mm -hmm. you said impartiality was the biggest issue yeah. for the BBC. What has been done to address that? Well, it, I mean, it's not just me, it's the uh, Director General who's the Chief Executive. And he laid out a strategy where impartiality is absolutely critical. And um, it's critical It's critical for the world. Um, uh, you know, we, we, will, we will speak the truth as we see it, irrespective of consequences. You know, our China correspondents had to leave China as a result of uh, 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 an article we published. Um, we can take those kind of risks, uh, whereas uh, I think, uh, although, although I think Bloomberg has grappled with the same issue, um, I think it's, it's harder for companies with shareholders to balance the interest of financial returns for shareholders versus what they're seeking to do. And I think you're seeing some of that in Facebook. Um, and I think you're seeing that in some of the ways they treat data and also some of the way uh, they treat news on their platforms. So impartiality is a competitive weapon for the BBC strategically, but it's also important for the world. And if I look back at the founding of the BBC, which is almost 100 years ago, some of the issues that led to the founding of the BBC are as true now as they were there, except now for the second century of BBC, we have to project them globally. And if, if we're to make a virtue out of one aspect of, of Brexit is that if we are in that sense not so aligned with the bigger blocks, it also gives us a position. It means we have to be free of governmental interference. And the way the BBC is set up, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, but it's due impartiality. 
So uh, the due impartiality is context, it's balance, it's, um, it's fact-based, and what the BBC has to do is it has to uh, detoxify some of the debates um, by creating trust. So it's a resource of people to turn to when they're trying to evaluate very difficult issues. How do you then overcome misinformation? How do you fight that? Well, this is evolving. I think we, in, we in, in, uh, in collaboration with a number of news organizations, uh, are working both technically to do that, um, but uh, we have to obviously police very carefully uh, our, own, our own journalistic uh, processes, and um, we, we uh, fight it by being a resource that people trust. And, and when, they, uh, when there's confusion out there, in either the echo chambers they live in in social media, um, or, or or otherwise in terms of their concerns about accuracy, that the BBC is a resource they can turn to to clarify the situation. It's not the only one there. There are a lot of other great, great institutions, but we should we should definitely be one of them. Well, talking of impartiality and the importance, which is of course we've seen the launch of GB News. Mm -hmm. They say that they're filling a gap in the market. That they feel that the people of the United Kingdom are not being listened to, they're mm. not being heard. Mm. They are being more opinionated, mm. led. Are you worried about that kind of competition and how do you see it affecting what the BBC do? Well, I think um, one of the things the BBC is conscious of is that it has to constantly challenge the risk of groupthink. And uh, you know, I've listened very carefully to what Andrew Neil has said uh, about GB News and also his, some of his concerns in the past about the BBC. And uh, something I want to encourage the BBC to be is more constructively self-critical. And, uh, and I certainly think that uh, some of the feeling that um, uh, people have acknowledged within the BBC in terms of the dialogues I've had there is that the BBC has been victim in the past of some degree of groupthink. And diversity of opinion is critical. And if you look at the metrics around groupthink, better decisions are made when you have diverse opinions uh, together and diverse opinions where there's a conversation. If you look at the uh, social scientist experiments, you'll see that that, that leads to more accurate, accurate uh, 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 decision making. And obviously one of the issues we have to address is editorial decision making to make sure that, that we're balanced. So um, uh, that we're doing within the BBC and I think it's only, it's only helpful to us to see a vigorous uh, and, um, and divert media in the UK um, uh, to challenge us because it allows, it, it allows you to ask yourself certain hard questions. Do you welcome them? Yeah, of course. You talk a lot about trust, Richard, and of course, we have to bring up the Lord Dyson inquiry. Mm. You were testifying in front of MPs yesterday. Mm. What sort of damage has the Martin Bashir inquiry done to the BBC? Well, I, 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 the, the BBC um, uh, is quite rightly self-critical. So uh, you will find that throughout this process, not only um, uh, have external organizations challenged the BBC around a particular situation, but within the BBC, we've had panorama programs that investigate what has actually gone on. Um, there's no doubt it demonstrated certain flaws. It, it demonstrated flaws in uh, the processes that were adopted by Martin Bashir in terms of uh, the ethics. Um, it also uh, demonstrated that the uh, degree to which the investigation to determine what had gone wrong was conducted wasn't sufficiently rigorous. Uh, so, and then, and then it also demonstrated that in rehiring Martin Bashir, uh, that the BBC should have asked far more searching questions, or had had the capacity. Um, to be more rigorous in evaluating, balancing his undoubted talents as a reporter against many of the issues that have blighted his career. So there are lessons to learn, and the BBC is far from a perfect organization. Every organization, large organization, is far from perfect. Um, 
uh, this was a, a, a catastrophic uh, problem for the BBC. I think the fact that it surfaced, the fact that it's been exposed is incredibly positive and the BBC will be stronger as a result of the consequences of that. We have a board-led board um, uh, uh, committee with some outside resources it, uh, allowing us to make sure that we're taking a fresh approach to understanding the lessons that we should learn. And we will learn from it and therefore we will be better. You talk about the rehiring of Martin Bashir in 2016, mm. which seems to most people extraordinary. How shocked are you personally that that happened? Uh, it was 2016. I mean, and uh, I'm, I was certainly, I'm certainly surprised. Uh, I, I should say, I don't think the media world. I think people within the media world were shocked because many of them had a sense of Martin Bashir's flaws and they were very they, they were shocked particularly following his in, the incidents that had taken place in the United States on the back of things that had happened over here um, uh, they, 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 they were within the media they were shocked um, I know that um, I'm sure that in, in seeking to hire him the team that were seeking to hire him were thinking of his best qualities to bring to bear in an interesting area, which is the religious area. Um, and I think that's where you have to have checks and balances. And the issue is, one of the critical things in governance is to ask the right questions. And because the executive always, in that sense, naturally have a bias to want to accomplish and execute well. And the person making the hiring decisions and the team making hiring decisions there felt that he would fill that brief to do the execution well. The issue wasn't around his capacity to execute. The issue was, was he the right person given his history, given how he might execute, or given his history in an absolute sense, given his ethics? And that's where you need to have the right checks and balances, and we didn't have them in place. What does it mean, do you think, for journalism within the corporation, though? What can be put in place to make sure that that never happens again? Well, this um, it, 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 it's been very federated in the past, the BBC. What, what Tim Davy has done, who's the Director General, is he's brought it together. Uh, the evaluation systems are changing to the senior leadership. And candidly, um, one of the things that will happen is an adjustment to the culture of the BBC. Uh, more open, more collaborative, uh, better, better measures like better whistleblowing uh, uh, measures in place, more accountability. And uh, those will be a positive. So um, you know, as I said, said earlier, I think that uh, this will be a very positive experience of the BBC net net in terms of how we, how we learn from it. And understanding the public's concerns, how do you gain their trust back after something well, so damaging? I, I don't think we've lost their trust. I think, um, I think a lot of people uh, have other issues with the BBC. So I think the impartiality agenda uh, and the fact that we have had series of highly polarized debates, Brexit, Scottish referendum, and whenever you get a polarized debate, news organizations can easily get caught in the crossfire and they can make mistakes. So I think the fact that this happened 25 years ago was, is, was an issue. I think that people recognize um, that the flaws happened in the past means they're not judging the present in quite the same way, albeit that 2016 wasn't, wasn't so long ago. Um, I, think, I think the bigger issue is, we, is the due impartiality we need to bring to bear in all these highly polarizing issues. And so I don't, I actually don't think that the, that the brand has, 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 I think the brand has been dented, uh, but I don't think it's been, it's in any way broken at all. When you say it happened 25 years ago, the late Princess Diana's brother, El Spencer, yes. yesterday, yes. came out and said, this is not finished. Yes, he did say that. And how do you feel? I, I don't know what he meant. So, I mean, Obviously, you know, it, for us, it's not finished because we, we're going to keep reforming the BBC and ensuring we have a culture where we ask ourselves the hard questions. Um, but around his particular concerns, I, I don't know what he meant. And as you say, Richard, yourself, the BBC is constantly under attack for, for different reasons. What is changing now and what would you like to see change going forward? Well, look, I think it's good to under attack. If you look at the engagement with the BBC is absolutely extraordinary. 90% uh, of people in this country spend over 18 hours a week with the BBC. Now, you know, that's 
more time engaged with BBC than many many with their partners or spouses. Okay, so 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 in that sense, and also people have grown up with the BBC, so it's part of the family. As a result of that, when they see things they don't like in the BBC, they feel it in an emotional sense because they feel let down by part of the family. So I I don't. I've certainly learned in the 12 weeks I've been here that the BBC will continue to excite strong views. And I don't think, I think social media always has many great strengths, but it's also an amplification uh, uh, arena, if you like, or individual social uh, uh, mediums are. The, the, um, and therefore, that can actually make uh, passions uh, about the BBC that become inflamed and you saw a terrible example of that yesterday, where the, um, uh, th that translated into uh, 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 violence in the real world towards BBC journalists. So um, I see it as a positive that the BBC is criticized because people care. And I think the approach the BBC has to have is to be self-critical and uh, not defensive, but actually ask itself, are these criticisms, whether they are correct or not? And we will continue to make mistakes. The issue is not to pretend that we're not. It's actually if we make mistakes to correct them. And how do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic crisis has impacted the corporation? And how do you see the BBC's future role in economic recovery? Well, those are, those are two separate questions. Let me deal with the economics first. Um, the BBC is critical to the creative arts and the industry. In, in the UK. It's a wellspring of talent. It's, it creates a competitive advantage for the UK. If you look at Amazon's spending in the UK is about 0.1% point, that they spend on content. Netflix is about 1%, uh, you know, uh, where over 90%. Uh, in addition, there's a multiplier effect of two and a half times whatever we spend, whatever uh, we spend in terms of the economy. We engage with about 14,000 SMEs. I mean, recently, um, uh, the large, uh, the, uh, uh, the large chip manufacturer uh, of uh, Arc was, was in the headlight. It came out of Acorn. It came out of um, uh, BBC's uh, uh, computer initiatives and chip initiatives um, about 20 years ago. So the BBC uh, can create a proliferation of independence. It needs to support the ecosystems. I think it's actually critical to create competitive advantage for the UK in relation to the world in a way that non-UK global players uh, uh, can't, can't rival. Now, in terms of, in terms of COVID, uh, the issue is, as you all know, it's, it's accelerated change, particularly in the digital arena. And it's, it's accelerated um, uh, engagement with content. Um, it's, uh, I think, made people more discriminating. Um, and I think it's created some incredibly exciting opportunities for us um, because one of the concerns I have is the richness of content we have um, isn't isn't even fully understood. If you only look at, I encourage you to look at BBC Sounds, for example, you know, the radio, the depth. I'm still, for example, receiving from friends through WhatsApp, you know, listen to this podcast that I, I, I myself didn't find on the BBC uh, uh, um, own, if you like, using the old fashioned term, portals. So I think we, 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 we have a great opportunity as a result of the accelerated engagement with digital content. I think we've got to figure out how to actually distribute that better, as I said, around the world. Um, but at the same time, for an organization with a competitive advantage, um, in that sense, this accelerated change allows us to surf our, our, our opportunity uh, where we have better content to deliver, both in the news, factual, and also for the culture, creative and cultural areas. You were Rishi Sunak's boss at Goldman Sachs. Any advice for him? <laughs> um, be careful. <laughs> and of course, the funding of the BBC is such a big topic now, isn't it, Richard? I believe some ne negotiations mm. are going on now. But do you think that the license fee has a future beyond 2027 when the Royal Charter currently ends? Well, one of the one of the good things about the competition is allowed people to benchmark what they're getting from the BBC with what they're paying. And the BBC right now is about forty three p a day, and for that you get news, 
you get radio, you get television, you get the iPlayer, you get sounds, and you also get the insurance of the BBC as a resource that you can turn to in moments of crisis. You get children's education that you can trust. Um, so for 43p a day, if you to try and create that bundle of services in, uh, in the private sector, it would cost a multiples of that. So we start from a position as a result of the license fee pay payment process. We deliver value not just in content, but also in a lower charge for the content we have than the marketplace norm for the quality of what we're distributing. So um, in that sense, uh, I think people are starting to actually appreciate that the license fee is worth having. Uh, now, whether the structure is right is an interesting question because there's a criminal sanction associated with any of you in the room who aren't paying the license fee. So, so I'm sure everybody has paid the license fee. Um, of course. The, uh, and that obviously is an extraordinary coercive element for some people who have issues with the BBC are concerned about. It's also regressive, it's a flat fee uh, per household. But at the same time, because we're able to capture it from so many households, it, it gives us a value proposition for each household that participates. And so on the one hand, while it's regressive because it's flat, it's actually progressive because it delivers to poorer households a value service at a lower price than they'd be able to capture otherwise. So um, there are a lot of elements we're gonna bring to bear. Um, you know, we're in discussions uh, with the government right now around the right level uh, for the remaining part here of the charter to set the license fee. Um, but at the same time, I, I start from the premise that it's a, it's a fantastic value proposition. Uh, the BBC needs to be funded to be competitive. Um, uh, and at the same time, uh, I watch very carefully the other pricing metrics from our competitors um, to see whether what we're offering you know, continues to justify the license fee as, it, as it's established. People do call for a subscription service. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could be in the future for the BBC? Well, you know, there are, you know, we, we have participations in some, some subscription models. We have Britbox International, which is um, successful in the US, for example, right now, uh, uh, a collaboration with, with ITV. Uh, I worry about uh, capitalism in the area of delivering inspiration, education, and truth. And there are a lot of other capitalist providers. There's no other public service broadcaster that delivers to the world what the BBC does. And so if I think about what this conference is about, which is the world over the next 10 years and the issues that matter, I think the world would, personally right now, I think the world would be in a more difficult place if it didn't have at least one large organization like the BBC capable of delivering a different world view. Capable, not necessarily that it does, but capable of delivering different world views because its norms aren't rooted in profitability. Richard, just before I open it out to questions here in the audience and also from around the world, I just want to ask you, we're talking about the next 10 years, where would you like to see the BBC, both here in the UK and globally? Well, I, you know, I'd like us to be, to be viewed around the world as uh, one of the leading global media players. Different, um, but uh, successful. And engaging with over a, at least over a, a billion people on the planet. And we have that, we have that capability to do that. And as a result of that engagement, making the world better. I mean, it sounds a bit like an answer to a beauty contest, but it's sort of <laughs> it's what I think. How do we build back better after the pandemic? Yeah. I'm now going to open it out to two questions. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. I'll start with you, the gentleman here. Oh, could you also say your name and where you're from <coughs> as well? Congratulations, and what's your question? In the short to medium term. 
<coughs> yeah, it's, look, the, the, the China isn't the only place that the BBC has been expelled from. I, I don't believe we've got people in Iran at the moment, for example. And for our Persian, but it doesn't stop us having a Persian service that's very effective and, and valued by people who want to engage with, in that language. Um, so I, I, I believe the BBC over time will have a very positive engagement with China. Uh, um, and I think that uh, we will have a positive engagement um, because we're independent and we are unafraid of voicing our independent views. And um, in the short term, that's created difficulties. But in the long run, I think that will work very effectively. And I could easily envisage a situation in 10 years' time um, that we, we are back uh, physically in China in a, in a larger way. Thank you very much. The gentleman here. You asked about government interference, you asked about music and um, uneconomic activity. Well, look, politicians of all hues from time to time have problems with the BBC and they, hopefully they will continue to do so um, because they're human beings and the BBC will have an independent and impartial perspective that challenges the narrative that they as individuals from time to time want to project. So um, I'd be concerned if we didn't have problems with politicians in that sense. Um, we certainly, the government has certainly not seeking to uh, direct us to behave in a certain way and we would and we're set up in a way to resist that um, and it may be that within the BBC people come from a background different backgrounds with particular political affiliations as they have done presently and they have done in the past but we leave those we try and leave those at the door and and, uh, uh, and we should do when we come into the BBC and, 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 and ensure that we're impartial so um, I'm not concerned about government interference I think we're set up with the license fee as an example to ensure that the government can't control the purse strings and therefore distort the mentality of the BBC and how it behaves. And I think actually the value of the BBC to the UK and to the world is that it's got that clear independence. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I didn't quite address the, the walled garden thing I was talking about before. Uh, there's certainly a concern that the attribution to the BBC, w the, we've learned the attribution to the BBC of BBC content on Netflix, for example, is highly diminished. There's a view that it's a Netflix production. And so, and so what matters to us is attribution and prominence. So uh, prominence is a separate issue I'll come to, but but, but, but the attribution matters so that the license fee payers or people engaged with appreciate that it's BBC content they're receiving. 
Um, and so we are going to have to think about that as the tactics of some of the uh, larger players we're engaging with is to try and present our products in a sense as theirs, um, or at least to diminish the BBC's or minimize the BBC's uh, 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 position in terms of the visibility of the BBC as creating the, the content, or even trying to obscure the prominence. And that also speaks to data. It's critical that we're able to capture data. If you look at smart speakers, it's critical that we should be able to understand who's engaging with BBC content and how they're engaging with it, so we can actually deliver personalized services or other services that we want to curate for those particular, uh, uh, that, that particular audience. So um, I think that um, it's something we're wrestling with. Um, it's partly driven by technology and it's partly driven by tactics competitors. And we need to consider what regulatory support we need in order to preserve our direct engagement with with the with our own tonight's customers. I think we've got time probably for one more. There were a lot of hands that came up initially. Yes. me because I've been there 12 weeks so um, <laughs> I, I can tell you uh, it I can tell you some things I'm focusing on that where I, I sense shifting one of them is is localism so if we've been talking a year ago I don't think we or pre-pandemic we'd have appreciated the importance of local news local information local radio for us uh, but also delivering to the nations and the regions content that speaks to people as they are in their communities. And I think a sense of community has increased as a result of whether it's temporary or not, I think it's permanent. And I think we see some of that in our 6.30 news broadcasting, which is incredibly popular, which is lo local. So I think the BBC has the capacity to deliver localism uh, very well. Um, I think in terms of an area that to me still has to uh, fully um, develop it is the different ways we deliver radio content as I've described in terms of sounds I also think that um, you will see from us you know that we will find ways to have to continue to refresh the iPlayer so the billions of pounds of content the sort of 15,000 hour hours of value that's within the iPlayer is more readily accessible so I, I think that aspect I think mobile and how people receive their um i think how people actually receive their content in a way that fits mobile is probably something we will evolve and i think what you're also seeing uh, with senior leadership is uh also very hopefully it's a very interesting focus on on children's as well thank you you have a wonderful executive director Prinsile malumbo and kuka of un women who i've had the privilege of working with thank you so much to everyone. I think that's all the questions that we have time for. And thank you to our international audience for joining us from around the world today. Thank you for being here. Thank you to COGX for putting on this incredible hybrid event. And last but not least, thank you so much to Richard Sharp, Chairman of the BBC. Thank you.